We don't think of trees as social beings, but a recent New York Times article profiles the scientist who says I that like they Stephen. are. I saw him In on fact, it. I think Professor Amber. Suzanne Simard's work has proven that trees, much like animals on land or in the sea, cooperate through complex systems of communication. And it's her work that's inspired a wave of new research into forest ecosystems. Ferris Jaber joins me now. He is the author of that article and a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. Ferris, welcome. You know, I have to tell you, when I read your piece, it was fascinating to hear about this because it's just not something that we really have heard a lot about. First of all, tell us, Ferris, what did Professor Simard discover about trees, quote unquote, communicating with each other? And why was her work so impactful for the scientific community? Suzanne Samard discovered that beneath the forest floor, tree roots are actually connected to each other through massive fungal networks. And carbon, water, nutrients, and chemical alarm signals can actually pass from tree to tree through these underground networks. And the reason this was so astounding is that in traditional forestry, trees are often regarded as competing individuals that are rather solitary. But what her work shows is that in some cases, they seem to be exchanging resources and information and ultimately helping each other survive, especially in times of stress and sickness. You know, it was fascinating to read about the professor's background. What about that made her especially equipped to make this kind of discovery? intimate knowledge of the old growth forests in Canada. Um, she actually comes from a logging family. Um, her grandfather and uncles are were horse loggers. And so she grew up um, watching them use low impact methods to take just a few trees here and there while she and her siblings were exploring the forests. And later she went on to study forestry um, in college and graduate school and as well as a uh, forest ecology. Um, and she was particularly interested in interactions, connectivity, and community, not just questions of, you know, how can we maximize tree growth and harvest, but what's actually going on ecologically with these trees, understory plants, and fungi. Well, what was the reaction from the scientific community? Because as you spell out, this is a mostly male-dominated field that she had entered into. That's right. Most of her colleagues were male, and there were a lot of older males that were initially quite skeptical, sometimes even disparaging of her studies. Um, her earliest studies were very provocative because nobody had actually studied these fungal networks in the wild before. No one had shown that such an, uh, an immense amount of resources could pass from tree to tree, even trees of different species. And it really went against some of the tenets of traditional traditional evolutionary biology to say that trees that were unrelated to each other, that weren't even the same species, might be sharing resources and, and possibly even helping each other. So initially, there was quite a bit of skepticism. But over time, Suzanne and other ecologists around the world replicated her findings again and again. And it's now become well accepted that this is actually happening. Yeah, can you just explain, Ferris, for people who might just be hearing about this for the first time, what exactly that means? So in a forest, when you have trees that uh, could be of different species, if they are connected with these subterranean root and fungal links, there can be signals that are communicated back and forth. So that if one tree is in distress, take us through uh, one of those examples of what exactly this kind of cooperation can look like. So plants of all kinds are constantly producing chemical compounds um, that signal what they are going through in the moment. And if a tree or a plant is under attack, say, from an insect, it will actually produce stress signals that will waft into the air. And other plants nearby can detect those stress signals and prepare their own defenses in case they get attacked by insects as well. And what Suzanne has shown is that that kind of chemical communication is not just restricted to the air. It actually happens below ground as well. Yeah, it's just really kind of mind-blowing to hear you spell that out. So, Ferris, what are the implications here when it comes to, say, commercial tree growers as well as forest management officials? 
So Suzanne Samard thinks there's some pretty profound implications uh, from her research for, for how we should manage forests. Um, it's, it's to completely strip um, a clear cutting side of all the vegetation, you know, removing all of the trees, including the biggest um, and most interconnected trees, as well as all the understory plants. And that massively disrupts the fungal networks and the microbes in the soil as well. So what Suzanne is advocating for is leaving, retaining some of the largest, oldest, and most interconnected trees when we log. And she calls those trees mother trees. And she thinks that by leaving them in the soil, any new trees that grow there, whether they've been planted by people or whether they're just sprouting on their own, will immediately tap into this uh, important fungal network that has been retained, that is still attached to those mother trees. And so those retained trees become nurturing and will hopefully help the survival and the health of the trees in the forest that grow. You know, finally, I want to talk about this notion of cooperation over self-interest where nature works together instead of competing for space and resources. After examining this topic, Ferris, do you think that there is a takeaway for us as humans interacting with each other as well as our own environments? Yeah, competition has been so central to traditional evolutionary biology for so long. This idea that individuals are constantly competing for space and resources and that they're often trying to leave more offspring than the other individuals and species around them. But I think in, in recent years, we've seen more attention and more emphasis on the importance of cooperation and connectivity in addition to competition. And I think that's something that's really come to light recently because of the pandemic. We've seen that we can't just go about looking out for ourselves all the time. We are connected to each other and dependent on each other, often with vast hidden webs of connectivity that only become apparent when they start to break down and when we become really vulnerable. And we've seen that countries where selfish attitudes have prevailed have had some of the worst outcomes in this pandemic, whereas countries where people have really banded together to look out for each other have fared much better. We really are all connected. Well, it's a fascinating piece. As I said, Ferris Jaber, thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.